PM SIG is actually product, project and program management. And I'm really pleased to uh, um, be talking with Matt Markham tonight, who I've known since 2010. I met Matt at a workshop called, called Agile Up to Here, which was a fun, spirited workshop uh, hosted by Elizabeth Hendrickson, uh, who is a consultant. Um, and it was all about deep dive into um, uh, agile practices with like a real customer, which was a which was colleague, I think uh, Alan Cooper. And the object was to help him build a website and in five days and test it and, and have really shake out a lot of the things and assumptions we had about, about agile. And I was kind of agile agnostic and I, uh, Matt, obviously was part of the, the event and it was really profound because Matt made me feel like there, it, it wasn't hard and it wasn't uh, pseudo intellectual. It was just about like real, getting real work done. And it was not about protocol or process, but struggling with, you know, the essential elements of what it meant to be a, like a human centric development. So in that same spirit, I'm really pleased that tonight um, he agreed to be my guest and to talk about key forces of change. Um, he's uh, the principal of a, a company called Tack Boom Shift, and he's also got a few other websites called thekeyforces.org, and also talks about this concept of oblique leadership. But uh, I'm uh, I've got a few uh, questions in mind. Um, we'll have Q and A at the end. But um, Matt, uh, he's served from in roles, all kinds of different uh, diversity roles, from principal engineer to product executive, 20 plus years of challenging mental models and, you know, as he says, disrupting the status quo. Um, he considers himself an org design leader and project strategist. Uh, he takes an evidence-based outcomes-driven approach to uh, company evolution. Um, and as Joe said, system, systems first, people-centric uh, organizations. Um, so with that intro, uh, Matt, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, yourself and, and tonight's topic uh, about um, forces of change, sensing the pulse of your organization, evol evolutionary optimization, and um, key principles that you want to get across. Sure. sure. Um, um, so I know... Um... I've been kind of doing the change thing for a man, as long as I can remember, even before 2010. Um, I think 2010 was the first year I started doing, like I went out on my own as, as kind of a consultant and then I've been in-house and out of house as a consultant since then. But um, you know, Joe mentioned like change is the only thing that's inevitable and we keep doing it. And I kept getting, you know, uh, either like higher and higher titles or uh, more and more influence and change. Um, it never got easier. It just shifted around like, where the problems were. And um, a friend of mine kind of helped me realize that what I was really interested in was um, a subset of, well, I guess a macro set of change called social systems design. Um, and that organization design is sort of a subset of, of that, you know, social systems that I applied to organizations. Um, and that that is a, a very deep and rich field, like uh, org design has been around as a, as a you know, a, an area of study since, I don't know, 1940s or 50s or so. Um, and there's like camps and, and authors and degree program. Like it's, it's wonderful. And it's nice that we're just now maybe sort of hearing about it in the product space and the agile space and, and everything is new again, but yeah. So um, the model that we're like, I was going to kick around with y'all tonight is called this, uh, the systems first model of the key forces of change. So I think of the two main things that I, I see missing in most change initiatives is they're not systems first and they're not people centered. Uh, systems first means we understand the nature of our organization as a system. We understand all the parts. We understand uh, how they're interconnected and those connections themselves are the things that tend to, uh, you know, make things either amplify or dampen. So uh, looking at those, I've been studying models like that myself for a long time. There's the model that I kind of have is very similar to some. It's different in some certain ways that I like uh, clearly. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made it. I just would have used somebody else's. Um, and then the people-centered stuff is not just, um, sometimes I think people-centered gets kind of 
you just kind of hand wave the side as like, oh, just be nice. And yes, that's true. You should you should be nice. Being nice is a good thing. Um, but I think of it as more of like we understand a lot about the psychology of change um, and we can apply those techniques to make sure that, you know, some of it's not even psychology, some of it's just good communications and making sure that things are clear and understood. But then we get into some of the psychological aspects of change and, you know, small group stuff and fear and loss and, and those types of things, too. But uh, we can dip into that tonight. Um, I'm happy to talk about anything. And uh, but I'm guessing we'll probably spend the bulk of, of the time on the systems first stuff. Great. Um, so why don't you um, jump right into the model? I know you have a, a couple of um, uh, depictions of the model that might be uh, good to talk about right off and give people a sense of what you're what you've modeled that is okay. might be useful to the group yeah let me share my screen um before i jump into this i will say one thing that isn't covered in the slides um, i think of this as a heuristic model um meaning the model itself is static and there's areas where we can fill in the blanks and there's some areas where i've filled in some blanks myself um I think of that as different from other like modeling techniques. There's the, I mean, if you want to model systems, there's loads of different modeling approaches you can do. There's like stocks and flows kind of circuit Don Alamedo stuff. Um, there's, um, I'm going to forget the name of it now, uh, causal loop diagrams, like the stuff covered in like fifth discipline. Um, there's a, my actual, my favorite modeling technique is something called CDE modeling. CDE stands for containers, differences and exchanges. Um, and that was developed by a lady named Glenda Yo Yang. And I believe the book that that came in was called Facilitating Organization Change. Um, I like modeling techniques. I love drawing pictures. Um, the downside of modeling techniques is unless it's well facilitated, if you just put a blank canvas in front of people who aren't familiar with them and go model your org to plan your change, man, it, they're just drowning. I mean, you, they're trying to learn what the modeling is even like and what it means. And then, you know, it's it, it can be really hard to, to look at that big blank white square and think, what should I draw first? So I don't think they're bad. Um, I just think they're complementary. So sometimes it's easier to start with a heuristic model like um, like this one because it, it, it anchors you, but that also helps you move further down the road. And you can combine that with CDE modeling or causal loop diagrams or whatever later. So, all right. With that being said, I'll share my screen. I think. Yep. Definitely sharing my screen. There we go. You have a screen share somewhere. There we go. Yes. All righty. So key points, this is a systems first overview. Um, I think, John, it looked like you shared the link, but if you go to the link, uh, the keyforces.org, uh, you'll notice there's the two models there. So the systems first is the one with the six circles and the people centered one is, uh, you know, the one that looks like three steps. So um, the overview, which you can see in the site is uh, there's three parts. Um, just the, the quick, uh, you know, the quick layout of the model as a whole. There's six pieces to it. There's some labels there. We'll talk through those mean in a second. Um, the model, it shows that everything's interconnected. Um, that just is there to allude to the fact that everything in a system is interconnected, especially people systems, complex adaptive systems, whatever we wanna think of that. But um, everything's connected to something else, uh, usually in multiple different ways. And what makes it more fun with people systems is most of those connections are invisible. So we can't see them. So we have to, visualize them or, or at least find some way of talking about them with each other and, and remembering what we talked about. So that's why I think models can be useful. Um, you also notice um, that we kind of split the model in two. There's kind of what I call the opaque forces on one side and obscure forces on the other. Um, and I kind of refer to all of these as forces. So the key forces have changed. These are these six areas. And then we'll talk about um, elements in a little bit too. So I'll jump right into these two. Um, is this big enough? I could go full screen if that's easier. I think it's good. Yeah, that'd be good to go full screen. All right, full, full screen. Woo! Let's go. All right, so um, there's 
what I think of as centering forces, there are things that tend to, um, I like to think of centering forces as necessary, but not sufficient. Um, the stuff in, in aligning, right? Like, what is your purpose? What's the mission of your company? Why do you exist? How do you do strategy? How to communicate? Those kind of align an organization. Uniting, very similar, but, you know, again, they're a little bit more opaque. They're like, do we have systems that actually synchronize our values? Like actually not just our spouse values and the posters on the wall, but you know, policies or mechanisms that actually put our values in in place. Uh, what are our experiences and narratives? What so when I say that these are centering forces and they're necessary but not sufficient, they can be necessary or they can be insufficient when they are just things like you've got your stat strategy document in a PowerPoint or you've got your values poster on the wall with if you don't have these forces in place, aligning forces, uniting forces, it's going to be very hard to do the rest of the modeling. So it's like if we don't have a strategy, we don't have a direction, then it's very hard to align the rest of the model or the, less, the rest of the organization to whatever we're doing. And we've probably all seen versions of that where strategy is very blurry, fuzzy, ill-defined, or not well deployed. And then basically you get different sources of power, whether executives, different, you know, directors with different agendas. The, there is no real strategy other than something that looks a lot like every person for themselves um, under the guise of like just making more money or increasing sales or making a better operating ratio or something. Um, so you, they, you have to have these in place, in my opinion, to be able to make trade-offs um, and choices in the rest of the model. But by themselves, they aren't going to really do much um, alone, if that makes sense. All right, so then defining forces, again, there's uh, two here, um, shaping and acting. So I think of the defining forces as the two very strong forces. So I think of the shaping forces is like, it's kind of like your skeleton. Um, your skeleton sort of defines what you can do. Like I can't hold five beers because I only have two arms. So uh, shaping, it's the shape of the org. It's how is you know power distributed, what kind of structures do you have? What roles? How do you have them defined? The definition of those roles is is how they're connected. So shaping is sort of um, it's almost a, a constraining force or limiting force because it's about what what's possible. Um, you can't do things that aren't structurally possible. For example, um, the acting force though is like that's like what will happen. That's like you know if the shaping is your skeleton, the acting is like your motivations and your your personal goals in life. So acting is what will happen within the constraints of shaping. So when you think about what are your organizational norms or your social norms inside your company, uh, what gets rewarded, how do leaders behave, um, and then have we done a good job um, making sure that we've tapped into people's intrinsic motivations and align people's intrinsic motivations with whatever we're doing at the company at a, at a larger scale. So those are going to actually move the company, which is kind of why they're called acting. And then last but not least, we kind of have these amplifying forces. So they're, um, they're not as strong as defining forces, but they're stronger than centering forces. And, and they tend to have either an amplifying or if they're not aligned, a dampening of force on the rest of the model. So um, the, you know, operating things, it's exactly kind of what it sounds like, like how do some of the organizational mechanisms actually work to do whatever it is that we're doing? So a lot of times that we see things like funding, staffing, uh, workflow, how do those types of things work? Um, developing again on the opaque side, these can be a little bit less obvious, but how do we actually do the development of leadership specifically and other talent in general? Um, when we're doing design of things, whether we're doing organization design ourselves, or whether we're talking about design of a uh, strategy, whether we're talking about design of a UI, um, are we doing more participatory code design of systems or not? Um, and then last but not least is very tactical skills and kind of capabilities that we have to be able to do the things in the org. Um, and then, like I said, all of this is interconnected. So everything can possibly be touching on one of these other things. So one example might be, uh, we want to figure out how does power distribution, uh, and funding connect? Does funding amplify how power is distributed? If power is distributed in a, in, in a certain way, in a very, very central way, uh, funding is likely to go in that direction because, uh, you know, power distribution is a defining force. If we decide to make a change to power distribution, but to date funding has been in place, like we probably see this with like a lot of, a lot of 
central budgeting and planning groups where we want to have the project plan for the year and there's a group that like submits budget requests and approves them that's a centralized so if we if we wanted to try to make a change to our power distribution to make power a little bit more distributed and less centralized but we don't change funding that's going to actually have a dampening uh, effect which is why it's called an amplifying force it just it doesn't necessarily mean uh, the change won't happen it just usually means that it will be more frictionful than if those two things were aligned in their connection if that kind of makes sense. Um, real quick touch on, you know, these things that you can see in the model, I have three things listed underneath core elements for each circle. Um, an element I have listed here. Well, the, the elements are on the website. An element is any thing that is in your company. It can be a group, it can be a team, it can be a person, it can be a department, but it can be a program, it can be a policy, it can be, almost any noun in your company. So you can imagine there are lots of nouns in your organization. So there are many elements. And actually one of my favorite ways to use this model as a heuristic model is to actually zap the core elements, put this up, you know, describe what centering forces are, describe what aligning and uniting means and kind of go through the headlines of each of these and then have people define, help, you know, help people understand what elements are and then have, you know, a, a group of people, whether it's an executive team or a change committee or whomever the people um, doing some org change is, go through and actually fill out, you know, brainstorm what elements do they think are impactful to uh, the change. And you can literally just go around this little circle of, of forces and have people brainstorm each one it's actually great if you have a large enough group you can have people work twos and threes and then rotate between them kind of doing like a brain writing brainstorming in a rotational role um the reason that i've been you know kind of filled in the blanks with some of these core elements is because in my time as a person trying to do lots of change in lots of companies these are the ones that i see coming up a lot now i have to admit um my bias is I'm only going to places that are asking for help. So on the plus side, they know enough that they're asking for help. <laughs> um, the downside is, is they know that they're not knocking out of the park. So I'm probably not getting called personally to go to places that are knocking it out of the park. So maybe the model would look different um, at those places. But but be that as it may, you know, these aren't uh, these core elements aren't the right elements. And, uh, you know, I don't believe anything is the right thing anyways, but uh, there are things for you to go and look at because these guys tend to be kind of the usual suspects. Um, and I've tried to pick words, hopefully not too esoterically, um, to communicate what I've seen in the companies I had. Uh, for anybody who's the kind of is a, an org design nut also at home, you'll notice a lot of this drew inspiration from uh, Jay Galbraith's uh, star model. He's written a number of books on organization design. You can uh, get a free PDF of his his star model, um, it's got five points instead of six. Um, McKinsey has another similar model called the seven S's. So it's seven things instead of six things. Um, but you'll notice that there's things, you know, it's they're all a little, a little bit similar, but a little bit different. So, but drew inspiration from all that. And you can see all the sources of inspiration on the website as well to try to okay. pay homage. Yeah. So the, the first reaction, uh, you know, I've seen this before, but I haven't heard you narrate like this. Um, so as a, either a product, a project, or a program manager, which is the spirit of the thing, um, you one of, one of the applications of this that I see in, in my work as a program manager is maybe doing a root cause analysis or a retrospective. Why did this happen? Why does this continue to happen? What's the pattern that we should address to, to take next steps to mitigate the risk it happens again. So this could be um, provocative in terms of conversations that you might start around why things that are the way they are. Um, I, could plug, I can plug into any of these circles and, and see that maybe it was because of the defining forces were uh, out of whack or unknown or a centering force was, um, was that what well, you often hear that a misalignment, you know, well, we have to, well, this meeting is about getting aligned with our team. And you mentioned, you know, planning season is coming up for many companies in September to plan their 2024. So that yeah. kind of uh, horse trading of, you know, what's the priority and, oh, but it's priority one for one team, but not a priority for another. So that's one of the applications I can see of, um, of how you might provoke some good conversations around getting the maximum potential from what you need to do. Yeah. And some of those things like, you know, um, 
Well, actually, I'll step through a couple little fun things. This won't take too long, but another way to do this, like you just mentioned, um, you can you can evaluate. I use you can use it for planning a change or understanding where you're currently at, or evaluating a change that you've tried that maybe either worked well or didn't work well to try to understand either how to replicate success or how to avoid, you know, more of the same failure. Um, this next set of slides is actually a subset of slides from probably my most popular talk ever called WTF, Why Transformations Fail. And um, it, I say it's been my most popular talk ever, which is probably small potatoes for uh, people that have really popular talks, but it's been requested like six times. Um, I've had, a, I've had in the past, I've only ever had talks requested one time, like a talk that I gave. And then someone was like, can you come give that talk? I'm like, yeah. And so this is, this is uh, this talk, the WTF talk has been six times, but this is kind of fun, like from an, an evaluation perspective. So, um, and hopefully I don't offend too many people, but um, when we think about like how we're going to do things like uh, some of these different transformations that we've seen. So an agile transformation, which is oftentimes just a scrum transformation, uh, love it or hate it. Here are the places where we typically touch the org, right? So we're gonna you know, we're gonna spread Scrum all around. So we talk about roles, right? Scrum talks about some new roles. Um, maybe we have to do staffing a little bit differently if we're gonna make um, like whole cross-functional teams. Um, Scrum has all the Scrum rituals and stuff. So we might be changing, making some changes to workflow. And of course, we're gonna send everybody to Scrum camp for two days to go get their t-shirt. So we're gonna go touch that skills and capabilities. So the funny thing is when you take a look at this and we say, well, how come our Scrum transformation doesn't work? Well, holy shit, man. There's six times three is 18 things we could be touching here and we've touched four. Not that, you know, and again, we talk about we, one of the lowest elements on the shaping force, nothing over in, you know, acting and uh, nothing that's uniting and very few. So um, you'll notice this is actually a bit of a recurring pattern. So let's take a look at like DevOps transformations. Actually, in my experience, even less. And I know like a lot of times these things get meshed up. So this isn't, this isn't the right way. This is my hot takes, whatever that's worth. Um, so you can see, right, some skills, capabilities, maybe some workflow, maybe some staffing, maybe it's very similar to Scrum. Um, a safe transformation, like we all love safe these days. So, okay, great. Safe does touch a little bit more. They try to talk, at least in their picture, they talk a little bit more strategy deployment, but basically it's just Scrum with a little bit more draped on top of it. Uh, we take a look at things like a product transformation. I've been hearing more and more product transformations. Um, I've actually seen personally these be the most involved. Um, they're trying to change around their purpose, objectives, or strategies. So these are all touching, um, this is touching the most that I've seen in, in most of these transformations I've been a part of personally. And digital transformation, which used to mean something very specific, like we're going to integrate our IT systems to talk to each other. Um, now digital transformation, I'm certain, means we've already tried all the other transformations and we're going to have another go at it. We're not sure what to call it, so we'll call it digital transformation. Um, but you can kind of see here, I think a lot of times what I see digital, they're spreading that love around a little bit more, but it's still, um, it's not touching as many parts of the model as even a product transformation was. So one thing that I do want to kind of point out, though, is like we said, okay, product touches the most. And you'll notice this was true for all of them. There were two bubbles that never got touched in any of these. And that's actually a recurring theme that I see in every every large major kind of transformy change thing I've ever seen. We never touch uniting and we never touch acting. We never actually get down to the root cause of things like what are our organizational norms? What are our acceptable or permissible behaviors, especially leadership behaviors? We have our espoused values on the wall, but people are demotivated because we're never really living them. Uh, we're not actually going through a process of an analyzing and attempting to change our experiences or the narratives that come from our experiences, which actually then shape our beliefs, which inform our actions, which you know create results. So it's an interesting pattern to go through all this and see, and, and maybe your mileage would vary, but um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what I've seen so far. It's only been fifteen years, so maybe. Yeah. Uh, this reminds me a lot of. The model from a book called Influencer, which which talks about well how how are we influenced to do anything, and it has a grid of motivation and ability, 
And then personal motivation and ability, social motivation and ability, and structural motivation and ability. So personal, social, well, structural on the y-axis, motivation and ability on the x-axis. And it reminds me a lot of that because I, I use the influencer grid to like trigger me into thinking, oh, no wonder this failed because the influence on the on the personal side wasn't there perhaps, or maybe the structural, like you want to pull the fire alarm, but there is none. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> that's a structural problem, right? Yeah. Um, and so is this, but this takes it a lot deeper and, and, that, and not in so many elements where you're assaulted by information on the slide. It's you know, like you said, like 18 different elements in six groups that may be a lot more helpful to figure out well, and explain like I was at a large, uh, large financial institution uh, a number of months back, and they did um, they did a very common thing. I mean, this is it's and it's weird because the story, the narrative to this this is um, there is a logic to it. It makes sense. They want to try new ways of working, but they're not really sure how that's going to work. So, what do they do? Um, they take a project that they think it's going to you know be useful for, or maybe they have a lot to. Um, they know they can't, you know, get the project done in, in their traditional ways. So kind of sort of what's to lose. We may as well try this new crazy way. So they get a couple of teams. Um, they assign some really interested leadership. They get some really passionate contributors and, and they, you know, do this thing and they rocked it. You know, they delivered well earlier, way under budget. And then of course the, the senior leadership goes, this was amazing. Give me my peanut butter knife and let's just go spread it around the org. And, you know, if we're going to, we can just let's start pointing to the model. Okay, well, well, before we start pointing to the model, as you can imagine, what happened was we fast forward this narrative about 12 to 18 months. And now leadership is like very confused. And this is executive leadership. They're asking questions like, our transformation seems to be stalling. We don't understand why we've told everybody how important this is. And don't they understand we had the example and it worked really well. Why don't, why don't, why doesn't everybody just go talk to those people and then just go just right. Just go do it. How hard could it be? And what's really kind of interesting is if you think about the things that they saw, the things that they were trying to spread around with that peanut butter knife, um, we could actually probably point to something a lot like this. They saw some new roles, they staffed it, they changed how they did some workflow, and they grew some skills and capabilities. What was really interesting is, now here's the cool thing about using a heuristic model. Because it's a system, and the outcome is what the outcome is, one thing that's very important about this model is, if the whatever the outcome is, is what this system is doing. Like it's, all of these pieces are in balance to produce whatever's being produced. So if the system produced something that they thought was um, novel and good, all of these things were somehow aligned to produce that. It's just that these four red arrows were probably the things that they saw or were easily visible and they chose to try to spread around. But remember the things that I mentioned at the beginning. They got the most interested leaders who were passionate about doing it. Well, we got the most interested and passionate individual contributors and role players to come in and actually do it. They were given no holds barred. So when you think about what's happening under the covers, we're actually touching on acting because within this, within this safety zone, we've created new organizational norms. We've tapped into people's intrinsic motivations and we've actually designed possibly some new reward systems, maybe not extrinsic reward systems, but maybe more intrinsic reward systems. Um, we had some set of synchronized values. We may didn't put posters on the wall, but we were living our values in some way, again, in this protected sphere. We had purpose and objective. Um, strategy in this case was probably fairly small, but there was a very clear uh, objective to, to be accomplished and how that got deployed was was uh, pretty clear because they were doing a lot of things like stand up meetings and lean coffees and uh, everything was very uh, permeable. So what's really funny is again, as you go and walk around this entire model and account for all 18 things and say, great, in this example of success, how were each of these things actually working? Well, then we can answer that. And then we can go, why is it stalling or out? Yeah. And we then come and look at this again. And we say, oh, well, the only things that we've managed to copy are four of the 18 things. So it's really like that was a very useful way of um, 
evaluating the differences in what leadership saw. Um, it was a little late at that point, but. <laughs> but it, it seems like a, a good tool for risk mitigation as well. When you look at these elements and say, what could go wrong with this stunt in advance? Like, could we anticipate and reasonably take some small mitigation steps to think about power distribution or purpose of objectives or permissible behaviors and different things and and to go, oh, well, that this went wrong in our last transformation or it, it worked well in the pilot, but if we scale it, we're probably gonna see some organizational structure issues, issues which is part of the heuristic, right? It may or may not work, but it's I see this as a series of triggers to provoke good conversations about, about change, especially if someone doesn't want change, right? If they are really happy in their role, like change is, change is scary. And if you're upset, you want change. So that's a really interesting organizational dynamic that this could also be useful for. Yeah, I think it can help dampen some of the fear because I think at least whatever fear of loss there is, is definitely amplified by uncertainty. And this doesn't get rid of the uncertainty, but it can help because you can help think about how all these things, what all these things are and how they fit together and are connected. We can probably reduce uncertainty a, a little bit. Um, one thing that I definitely feel, I don't know, kind of responsible to say is um, if you try to change all of these things all at once, you're definitely boiling the ocean. So I would definitely not recommend that. But again, actually to use this as a heuristic to think through, you know, what maybe what should go in what order, right? Or how should we, you know, maybe, you know, starting with that pilot team was not a bad idea. It's just how they try to scale that pilot team was non-functional, but they could have, you know, they could have said, great, what, you know, if I kind of use some org design speak, what they picked was a market facing value stream to start with a small one. That would have been fine. Um, they control, they hold, they held a lot of things true, like how budgeting and leadership and strategy and all that work. They, they kind of stack the cards in the favor. A really useful second step, instead of just saying spread it all around, would have been to pick a second market facing value stream. And they could have then repeated these tactical and operational things that they knew were already working. Of course, it's a different group of people and a different value stream. So maybe there'd be some adjustments, but those would hopefully be minor. But now with two market facing value streams, we might have decisions to make. If we inject at the same time, a platform group or something that's a horizontal that supports both of those verticals. Now we definitely have a need to make some type of a, a trade-off. Uh, if we've got a capacity constraint and we can only serve one boss, how are we going to pick which boss to serve? And we could actually use that as a sensing mechanism itself. It's like, it'd be like pushing down the waterbed and seeing which marbles fall towards it, right? So you could actually use that as almost like a stress test to be like, great, where are we weak on? And, and of course, you can look at the model and go, well, man, platforms like horizontal functions struggle to make trade-offs because either they're under capacity or they don't know how, they don't have the decision criteria they need pushed down to a level that they can use to help them make that trade-off. So just by adding those three things as an incremental thing, a second market-facing value stream and then a horizontal function, we could have start, you know, boning up our strategy deployment processes, as well as maybe maybe take a look at how we fund things and then maybe take a look at how we do some of the um the comms and uh making some of the decisions with regards to trade-offs. Awesome. I, I see this is um, licensed on Creative Commons, so it's out there in the domain. Are you looking for feedback and and enhancing the model in in uh, in some way? You open yeah, to that? Yeah, I'm always up for up for feedback. Um, it's like I said, I it actually took me years and years to ever even put anything like this out. I don't. I can I can point to every piece of the model and tell you you know, which couple of books or articles, like, so, uh, you know, a friend of mine convinced me, hey, no, there's enough, there's enough interesting thinking in here. Maybe you should put it out into the world. Yeah. So I, I put it out on a, a dot org and everything's licensed Creative Commons. Um, yeah, there's definitely feedback mechanisms. You can book time with me, um, you know, through my Calendly up in the, in the let's chat. Uh, there's an email, send an email. So however people want to do feedback. I would love stories too, um, success stories or, or, or less successful stories um, of using the model. It'd be great um, if anybody wants to kick around ideas on how to use the model. I'd love to try to you know prime the pump and get that going too. Great. Yeah, I think you uh, on your LinkedIn profile 
uh, your your posts are are pretty transparent about your office hours and about little you have little mini conferences you have lean coffee uh, you seem pretty invested in, as an influencer in your community at least uh, uh, if not just in the uh, Cleveland area then you definitely have reach on LinkedIn and and I enjoy seeing your posts because you you seem to earnestly want to get feedback and learn and see where where this um, uh, your ideas can be enhanced and I have a lot of respect for that. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, I, so. I urge everybody to follow Matt on, on LinkedIn. Um, all right, let's do another, uh, do one more uh, topic, and then we'll, we'll go to Q&A. Um, uh, so Matt, any, uh, any like um, closing slide or a burning issue or some, um, in, another important element you want to get across about the a key forces model? Um, I mean, there's some interesting implications in some of it, like, and I guess one of the reasons I'm so interested in in just getting good systems first people centered change out in the world in general is because I feel like these problems shouldn't be the hard problems. Um, what I think we'll find is once we're good at doing systems first people centered change, we're gonna find out that we've got bigger social things hiding underneath the covers. Like the purpose of business in society, like how how businesses should be fundamentally structured not just like who reports to who but should we be using corporations or nonprofits or b corps or stewardship owned or worker cooperatives like should there be different structures to the entities of business because those then drive you know the incentives and the organizational norms at the highest level so i just think like once we kind of get good at what i think of as the tactical and operational change doing systems first people centered stuff it will free us up to do more interesting change work as people as citizens okay so in terms of you said this before earlier in the talk um this model isn't meant to be a, a like a top-down checklist although it you know it's, it's it is it does have a circular nature do you find that it's a, there's more often than not there's a good place to start with with this model? I mean, yeah, you can plug sure. and play anywhere, but. Yeah, I like to start, well, I do like to start at the top. Um, and I don't like to spend a ton of time there, but because again, like the, the centering forces are necessary, but not sufficient. They're the weakest of the of all the six. Um, but it's good to just go through and kind of check like, hey, are we aligned? Do we have like, you know, a purpose and objective? And purpose and objective mean a lot of things. I understand that some of these are kind of like weasel words, but is it a purpose and objective for the company? Is it a purpose and objective for our group that's trying to enact change? Is it a purpose and objective for an, a new outcome that we're trying to do the change management for? Like it, it can be wide or narrow, but do we have those things in place? Um, then I kind of like, I, I prefer starting with the obscure forces. That is probably my personal bias because I think we, we do such a great job ignoring them most of the time that I think there's probably more hiding in those buckets than we give credit to. And sometimes I feel like if we tweak those things first, we might see natural ripple effects coming across in the connections. Um, one of my favorite things to do is actually taking a look at experiences and narratives up in the uniting force. And when we think about a change, whatever change we want to make, let's think about like what what experiences do we have in our company that's related to that change. And I I hesitate to use the word culture because again, culture can be this very hand wavy idea, but I like to make it concrete. Like if you were to talk to an anthropologist or an archeologist about how do they know what a society's culture was, they would say things like, well, we looked at their important people and we looked at their important rituals and gatherings. We looked at their important artifacts. Like there would be a small list of the things that they said defined a people's culture. I think an organization is more or less the same thing. Like who are the important people? How and when do we interact with them? What are our important meetings? What are our important artifacts? Again, we can go down the short list of probably four, five, six things and be like, this is our culture. Our culture is where the experiences come from. So how do we interact with those very important people? How do we feel and what are our expectations at these very important meetings, right? Um, and we can actually analyze it then because it's more concrete and just saying, oh, it's a mindset, you know? Yeah, what I like about this model too is it just popped into my head that there's that saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? But also subculture 
I think, eat culture for breakfast. And you could use this model to address culture and subculture. Is there, a, is there an important working culture underneath your culture where work actually gets done? Because it could be a subculture of two people. And yeah. they know the systems. They know how to work together. They enjoy the work. They like making changes that, that benefit other people. I see it, I see it all the time. And this yeah. this could help like turn it from obscurity to your point into transparency. Yeah, um, I think that would be a good I like that framing actually. I would go through the obscure forces and try to and try to turn them from obscure to transparent it would be pretty cool. Cool. Well, we have our, our first uh, question. Um, uh, the question is, this is really a great way to visualize a system. Do you have thoughts or experiences on how business process modeling and notation, or BPMN, I never heard of that before, business process modeling and notation, fit in to support understanding processes, or have you found other techniques more valuable? I also have never heard, uh, if that's a formal thing, like BPMN, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I've seen it or if I have seen it, I didn't know it was called that. So that would be kind of cool. Um, I have used, like I've said, there's other modeling techniques that I have used, stocks and flows. Um, things like I, I use the CDE or a modified CDE modeling myself. Um, even from a process modeling perspective, I do a lot of value stream mapping or value process mapping. Um, and all those things work well. Like uh, I think they all fit together. They all complement one another. So, um, you know, CDE modeling, for example, would be really great at modeling uh, groups and how those different groups, like you could actually use CDE to start teasing apart what the org structure is. And you might start drawing it like your typical reporting tree because reporting is certainly one kind of connection. But then you can start modeling through, um, you know, differences and exchanges, other kinds of connections. And, and the differences part of, of CDE is very important because that actually comes back to some of our, uh, the goal seeking nature of some of our groups. So uh, differences could be um, differences in how we work together. Um, differences could be how we're incentivized to do our work. Um, but wherever there's an important difference between two groups that are connected um, is really important. Actually, two of my favorite modeling techniques to do together is CDE model sort of the, the people system, and then um, separately go ahead and model something like a value stream map or a value process map. But then once you have that done, actually overlay the value stream map, which is usually more you know process boxes, on top of the CDE map. And then watch how value is trying to flow through your people system. Um, and you'll usually wake up screaming um, because you've realized your people system is probably not actually designed to produce value. <laughs> but that's uh, but that's fun. That's why we do it, right? So Okay. Got it. I, I, I never heard of CDE, and so I, I just Googled it. Uh, container differences and exchanges. So I bookmarked it. I'll look into it a little bit more. Um, cause it does seem to have some interesting, um, ways to look into the dynamics of patterns that surround us. So, um, all right. Uh, for those in the audience who may find this talk a bit abstract, do you have a concrete example of a company like using the model or a particular instance you've applied this model on a gig? Yeah, well, um, yes, I don't, I mean, not in terms of adoption, like without me so that would be awesome like i said uh, this really only came to fruition like out of my brain and onto this site this way in the last uh 12 months so um i've this used to exist in a collection of google docs that i would refer back to myself only uh, as i would go and do kind of change consulting um I, I mean i think probably the most concrete example uh recently was again you know large financial institution, you know, top 10 in the world type of deal, executive team seeing their change effort for their agile transformation slow down. Um, the concrete things that we saw happening on the ground is they had made cross-functional teams, they had taught them things like Scrum um, and how to do iterative uh, development. They had brought in um, agile technical coaches to teach them some of the development practices, right? So they'd, they'd kind of done what I think of as the, the checklists agile transformation. Um, when they realized that it wasn't 
having the outcomes like 12 months into this that they were hoping for. And I started talking with the senior leadership using this model to show, well, hey, if if you said that worked, all of these things must have been working together in concert. So we did actually go through them. And for example, we did say, well, hey, who were the who were the senior leaders involved with those people with the, with that initiative? Well, there was you know X, Y, and Z. You know, obviously, I can't name names, but and you know, we take a look at those people and say, well, what what kinds of leaders were they? Well, they were senior leaders. Well, but how did they behave? Like. You know, were they leaders of the people? Were they more a distance, you know? Um, and so we started taking a look at how evaluating their leadership behaviors and their leadership styles. And it became very, very obvious very quickly that they were atypical leaders for, for this institution, right? They were definitely talented, but, you know, at a large company, you tend to promote the middle of the bell curve, right? It's, it's, sort of the law of large numbers maybe um so those are like and you know i could go on with more specifics but yes for sure we can you know budgeting was another one that you know same kind of thing budgeting time of year would come around everybody was supposed to come up with their project list of things they think they could do for the year those project lists would get rolled up and then rolled up again and then submitted to some type of like you know, financial review team of senior leadership. And they'd usually just kind of stick their finger in the air and go 10% less. Um, and, and of course, when we found out, well, great, that seemed to be causing a lot of friction with the change because there was a lot of at least administrivia going on. Um, there was always, especially for horizontal functions, there was always a challenge with getting budgets uh, for things that were more like support budgets or augment, there were always struggles with getting those things funded because they weren't directly delivering value. So again, you know, we said, well, great. How does funding work in this in this you know special microcosm that you created? Oh, well, we fixed budget for them. You know, yeah, one or two senior leaders had to go through some weird machinations to get the budget, but but they did that, and then the budget just acted like a permanently stable funding stream. And it's like, oh, well, awesome. So can we make permanently stable? Oh, no, no, we can't do that. Well, okay, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty important one. <laughs> like, I don't know if this, uh, does that sound more concrete. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, I think I think I think so. Is it? I was paraphrasing a question that came in from from the audience, and uh, and I I think for for me as as we go into uh, planning season here, um, and I think about my team and the initiatives we want to install, um, I would take a look at all of these 18 dynamics and say, to what degree um, should we pick like the top three to five to kind of ensure, you know, um, some modicum of success if it's goal oriented, right? Um, and so I, I uh, one thing I could do is um, call a meeting with my team as kind of the facilitator and just have a brainstorming session about, and, and just, just like you did, like with a slide build and say, okay, let's start with obscure first or aligning and uniting first and say, here's some things that I'm worried about in my experience that have gone wrong before when we've tried to do an initiative. Let's, let's talk about like forestalling those if we can, and then start to provoke this kind of list of actions that, that people could sign up to, to administer and just kind of be on the watch for and set up a cadence moving forward as we, introduce other teams to our values and initiative and like the why like why are we doing this here here's that's a big deal like okay here's why and here's what's in it for you and all the typical things you know storming forming norming performing and then but this takes it to a, a really interesting level to kind of parse out specific actions that you could take uh, moving forward to kind of ensure that that whether it be adoption or engagement or some like you said the uh, finger in the air of 10%, whatever that might mean, uh, give that more meaning, meaning to the rhetoric. But that'd be like how I would distill. Uh, I wonder right. if, um, uh, you know, folks here or, or just in general, it's actually been something that, I don't know, maybe there's a chicken egg problem because, you know, people would need to know about the model or maybe they would need to know about this model, but just about systems first change in general. But I kind of like the idea of something like change club you know, like fight club, but for org change. And, you know, we could all get together once a month to support each other through the lens of systems first people centered change. The idea being everybody comes with their change challenge. Like here's the initiative I'm trying to get going. And we could agree, like the, the group, the club, the whatever could agree, like, hey, we're gonna, 
you know, we're going to use this Q forces model. We'll go through each of these and we're all brainstorm with each other. Sometimes it's hard to get honest or at least unbiased feedback from, you know, your colleagues. Um, sometimes it's not always easy from other employees, you know, they're anchored in uh, the culture of what is uh, there. So, I mean, that could be an interesting, you know, community first way of getting getting some of this stuff a little bit more concrete and applicable in yeah. people's context. Yeah. Even if it's a kind of a crowdsourced, like lean coffee as you as you uh, host, uh, sometimes just a quick little agenda in an hour, what topics can you cover that might be useful for risk mitigation or a change challenge? Like, yeah, uh, that'd be fun. So we have uh, about seven minutes left. Uh, I'd like to open it up for more questions or if you do have a question and you wanna be heard, uh, through the mic, uh, Shelly can open your mic for you. Um, but uh, is there anything that is top of mind or any reactions from the group? Yeah. Always. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Matt, that was wonderful. That was a great, okay. great talk. One thing that struck me most uh, was your your chart of the circles, because it's something I've always embraced. And that is that if, if you take one circle and you're sitting around by yourself and you're making notes, then you're one mind. If you bring somebody else in, then they have their ideas, you have your ideas, but there's actually a collective third mind. And that's what you had in the middle there. And if you add a third person, it's exponential. It just keeps going. I mean, there, there's all of a sudden seven or eight months that are collaborating on these ideas. And that's where it gets exciting. And you bring more people into the group. We do a lot of that at Gorda, uh, where we you get together and we share ideas. But I really liked what your uh, graphic demonstrated there with all the connecting lines and everything. I thought that was really valuable to me. And it, it, it it play into, you know, uh, value streams and distribu distributional behavior and everything else that you talked about. So thank you for that. Yeah, you bet. It's an interesting uh, uh, a topic of facilitation of this kind of um, uh, model uh, in a room on a whiteboard with people. Um, mm -hmm. And um, any advice there, Matt, as you've been a facilitator of important conversations to have, rules of thumb to host such uh, maybe a, a brainstorming session, as Joe yeah. points out? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, some of this is, it would I would just reiterate rules of good facilitation. So like, make sure that the people that are, that are involved are there and willing participants. Make sure that we've got whatever uh, ground rules set that we need to with regards to communications and respect. But with regards to the model itself, like make sure that whatever we're putting in the center, the change, the challenge, the whatever, um, that the, there's clear and uh, that it is stated clearly. So make sure that you set enough time for any clarifying questions about, you know, what do you mean by this? Oh, our, you know, our goal is to increase business value. Well, what, what does that mean? Like, Business can be a lot of things. Value can be a lot of things. So what are we talking about here? And how would we measure a good change outcome? So that has nothing to do with the model specifically and everything to do with just good change. So then, you know, making sure that that's clear, then you can start walking to the model. Um, I think I, I did a quick little hat tip first. One of my favorite ways to, um, to start the facilitation is just introduce what I think of as the meta model, which is the model without the core elements listed explain what all the words are, um, and then have people brainstorm their own elements. And one thing that I've noticed um, with a, you know, a friend of mine who did some facilitation with this is because we're all guilty of this, um, the elements are the things that we see, but the elements are the parts of the system. So it's very, it is certainly useful to say like, how, what is org structure or how would org structure be working here? But the important part of what makes it a system is that it's connected to something else. So when you're doing the facilitation, yes, it's easy to go and brainstorm, like what are the elements or to show the core elements that I've identified and say, how do these work here? But those are just the parts. The very important part is to then ask the follow-on questions. Great, for the change that's in the center, the connections all pass through the change. How does structure connect to workflow? 
how do our organizational norms connect to leadership development? So the, the magic, the real magic of systems is in the lines, right? In the model, not in the words, in the, in the bubbles. Interesting. All right. Um, well, All right. Hey, I have a general question for the group, if anybody wants to chime in. So in your organization right now, when uh, you're hiring a vendor or engaging with a, any kind of uh, business relationship, where does the priority come in price or value? And how do you gauge value? It's a tough question sometimes, right? Because you have to manage your budget, but at the same time, you want the best value you can get, the best service you can get. I always try to sell value. It's hard to sell value because there's disagreement on what it is. Although if you want to map it to cost, then you could say, what's it costing you to not have this change in place? Um, right. A funny but adjacent question is, when people ask you, like if you're interviewing for a job and people ask, what's your salary expectation? A fair answer should be, well, what's it costing the organizations to not have the role right now? That's what yeah. I would like my salary to be. And that should be a fair trade. And they never, ever can ever answer that question, which is crazy. <laughs> That's what a great way to answer that question. It ask doesn't make question. any friends at parties, though. Like you, right. you will not get any jobs uh, <laughs> yeah. if you ask that question. So, yeah. No, it's a great question, though. Yeah, some believe that right. way to find value is to take it away, right? And so you mean people may want to experiment with that at at cost to somebody else. So it, yeah, it's an interesting, provocative question. Um, all right. Uh, so in closing, Matt, how can people contact you to learn more or engage you in, in many of the kind of um, uh, organizational and, and uh, almost social communal activities that you have around uh, org design and uh, change and leadership. Yeah, um, I suppose the easiest thing would be LinkedIn. Um, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I am I do have, I'm kind of always posting in general, but always posting about the you know, I have office hours every Thursday. Um, those are free to use for anybody kind of first come first serve is like four slots, 30 minute slots. Um, so those get posted out all the time whenever I host. I try to do a lean coffee once a month, but as you guys said, August can be kind of slow. So I don't think I scheduled one for this month. But um, yeah, I try to do lean coffees. And then I'm trying to, I, I want to try to launch maybe instead of, but maybe in addition to lean coffee, something like this change shop or change club or, or something that's a little bit more focused on the key forces model specifically. Um, but I'm pretty, I mean, I'm pretty open, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a professional time manager, so don't ever worry about asking for something that I might not have the time for. I'm, I'm happy to try to help whomever I can. If I can't, I'm very comfortable saying I, I don't have the time to help with this right now. Or, you know, hey, you've asked a couple of great questions, but if we go into three or four more questions, I'm probably going to have to ask for money. Um, yeah. So very yeah. comfortable with those, and but very happy to do a lot of support along the way. I just most oh, of you wonderful, and thank you. Yeah. And thank you for a wonderful talk. And John, thank you again, as always, for hosting and organizing this. It's so great to be, you know, associated with you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, thanks again, Matt. Yeah, we'll, we'll see everybody uh, next time. Stay tuned for announcements on our next speaker for QA SIG and PM SIG. So we'll see you next time. Sounds good. All right. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.